Shalom, Bruchim Abayim, and welcome to Sheva Impani in the Torah to the 70 Faces of the Torah and also Sulam Yaakov. Well, I hope everyone has enjoyed the Sukkot season, and I would like to say once again to everybody out there, Chag Sukkot Sameach. However, we now come to an end of the festival of Sukkot of the time of Zaman Simchuteno, the time of our rejoicing. The last official holiday that we celebrate, according to the Torah, is Shmini Atzeret which is the eighth day, which literally in Hebrew, Shmini, or from Shimoni, which means eight, and then Atzeret means to stop. And in a way, it's considered a farewell celebration because between this time, okay, and the month of Nisan, we do not actually have any mitzvot in the Torah to ascend Yerushalayim, which consists of the Shalosh Rachelin, the three pilgrim feasts that the men of Israel were to require three times a year, starting with Pesach, followed by Shavuot, and then uh, consummating at the end in the fall season with Sukkot, okay? And so Shemini Atzeret falls right on the heels of Sukkot. However, also right on the heels of Shemini Atzeret is Simchat Torah, the joy of the Torah. Now, normally in the diaspora, Jewish communities observe Simchat Torah separately as, as its own little special holiday. But in Israel, Shemini Atzeret and Simchat Torah are observed on the same day. Now, the topic I would like to talk to you guys about here today is the topic of Simchat Torah. This is why I have subtitled the teaching, The uh, Mystery of Simchat Torah. And the reason why I named it The Mystery of Simchat Torah because where do we find Simchat Torah at in the Torah? Okay, similar like Hanukkah Purim, right? Uh, these are somewhat, you know, directly or indirectly related to events in Jewish history. We do read about the whole story of Purim, at least in the actual Ketavim, the writings of the Hebrew Bible. Hanukkah is not mentioned whatsoever except in the apocryphal writings such as the uh, Sefer Chashmonaim or the Book of Maccabees, as well as the various or various Mepharshim or rabbinical commentaries that deal with the whole Maccabean revolt against uh, Greece. So nonetheless, we do find those days mentioned as well as Tu Bishvat, uh, we find also amongst the writings of the rabbis, the New Year trees. But Simchat Torah, we don't actually find. However, there is a connection to Simchat Torah in the Torah. And this is important and something I'd like to share with you all today. The other thing I pointed out through my teachings, if you've been studying with me, if you have, thank you very much. I hope that you've been uh, impacted and challenged by many of the things I have said over the high holiday season. And it also, you benefit from it and it helps enrich your life greatly in your relationship with Hashem. But nonetheless, I explained during the weeks of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and also especially Sukkot, is that we encounter Sukkot in the fall season because Sukkot is a tukum for the Chet Ha'egel, the sin of the golden calf. The 15th of Tishrei is when the Ani HaKavod, or when the Shechina, return to Israel. Now when we analyze the High Holidays, we see how they are pretty much related to one another. Okay, and in my teachings between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, I explain how the Aseret Yemei Teshuva, the 10 days of Teshuva, really represents Hashem's assessment on the creation, which is why Rosh Hashanah also is known by the pseudonym Yom HaDin, the Day of Judgment, as well as its other names that it's alluded to, like Yom HaTruwa, Yom HaZicharon, Rosh Hashanah. Okay, these all have a significant uh, connection to what we would call judgment, but from the perspective of Hashem, it's not a judgment in the sense of basically doing bad unto people, but an assessment. And therefore, God runs a special enterprise, a business per se, and that business is called tikkun, rectification, specifically the rectification of all the creation, not just this lower reality that you and I live in, however, also other parts of creation that we are not fully aware about. And so, therefore, God, He looks at Israel, where judgment starts in the house of Hashem, in which I discussed this in a previous teaching that deals with the unique phrase that appears in the Mishnah, that all creation of Rosh Hashanah passes before Hashem as Kivne Maron. And the sages offer different interpretations about what that phrase Kivne Maron means. And however, many people understand it to mean that essentially that people pass before Hashem like sheep, and therefore He's like the great shepherd, he analyzes, he probes, he sees who's the weak from the strong. And so nonetheless, what God is doing at that time is an assessment. So he's going to determine exactly what is going to happen within the world for the new year. And so as we enter every new year in the Hebrew calendar, Hashem does an assessment. But this assessment starts with his management team. And his management team is 
Am Israel, the Jewish people. And so therefore, wherever Jews are located in the world, whether it's in the Middle East, in Medinat Israel, the state of Israel, North America, South America, parts of Europe, and also the Asia continent, Southeast Asia, the islands, it doesn't matter. There's Jews in Antarctica. Hashem essentially assesses Israel based upon their standing with Him in the Torah, and that determines whether or not the world is going to experience blessing or chasachlila, the world is going to experience curses. And so basically God does this as an assessment. And so the sages explain that Hashem is entering into uh, a 10-day assessment period. We also allude to this as a litigation process. That In the heavenly court, there's a court case taking place. The Satan acts as the prosecutor, the heavenly prosecutor, in which he brings different charges against Israel, and not only Israel, but also against the world who doesn't know Hashem. And so basically he's demanding uh, strict judgment and justice to be brought upon all of humanity. And so during these 10 days, this Aserah de Teshuva, these 10 days of repentance, 10 days of awe, what's happening is that Hashem is judging who is called the Benonim, as I explained in another teaching, I believe I subtitled it, The Book of the Soul, based upon a Maimar Chazal in which the sages explain that between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there are three books that are open before Hashem. You have the uh, book of Sadiqim, Gimurim, those who are completely righteous. You also have a book for Rosh Hashanah, the book of the complete wicked, and then also a book for who's called Benonim. Uh, Benoni is an individual who hangs in the balance between two extremes. And one of the things I discussed in that teaching is that it's not that Hashem literally has three books open. The book that He looks at is the Torah. That is the Sefer Chaim, the Book of Life. And He determines where a person is at in relation to the Torah, whether or not they're going to be judged as a Sadiq or a Chassas Khalil a Rasha. And I also explained that teaching, being called a Sadiq or a Rasha per se, has nothing to do exactly with being a Sadiq per se, but it has to do with the actual outcome that God judges you with. So in other words, if you were judged to be a Sadiq, that means that God has basically determined that you are righteous. Now, it doesn't mean that you were a righteous individual, that you did all types of great, uh, you know, acts of tzedakah, charitable deeds, you know, gimlu chasadim, kind acts, and, you know, many other good things that the Torah requires. You may have been a rasha, in a sense. You may have been a very selfish individual. You may, may have been narcissistic. So what God determines is He looks at you in relation to your teshuva during the 10 days of all. And so in the heavenly court, if He makes a actual verdict and He says that I am going to actually declare this individual a sadiq or sadeket, well, that means that your outcome is that you have been judged to be declared righteous in the eyes of God. And the way we can look at it is you've either been declared as innocent or guilty. However, in the terms of rabbinical language, you're either judged as a sadiq or a rasha, right? Which means... You can also be someone who is somewhat familiar with the Torah, who is engaged in charitable acts and Gimlu chasadim and all those other good things that come with trying to identify with the Torah. However, there's parts of your life that Hashem finds displeasing that's only known between you and Hashem. God can actually, God forbid, determine that in the Aserah Yom Teshuva, that the verdict for your life is that you could be deemed a rasha, you could be found guilty. What that means, nobody knows, because ultimately Hashem is the one who's going to issue the penalty for being declared a rasha, just like he, he actually issues a statement, a blessing for those who are declared righteous. And so depending on what happens for the up and coming months of the year, it's completely uh, confidential with Hashem and His heavenly agents in the world above, even the Satan who He uses to actually go and to actually test man or to punish man whenever they are not doing His will. And therefore, the Satan doesn't have a power, any, any power of his own. He's, uh, he's completely dependent upon Hashem. As we explained from the Torah in Om Avadol, there's no other reality but Hashem Himself. So nonetheless, the Benonim are going to be determined to, uh, they're going to be weighed, I should say, to be determined if their outcome is found favorable or, God forbid, not favorable. And so, five days after Yom Kippur, when we go through Yom Kippur, we arrive on the 15th of Tishrei, which is Zaman Subchotein, or the time of our rejo rejoicing, excuse me, which is the time of Sukkot. Now, what most people don't realize, and I explain this in other teachings, is that there are numerous verses in the Torah that make it very clear that Sukkot is actually related to Yitzhak Mitzrayim, specifically in Chodesh Nisan. Now, 
If that's true, then why uh, does Sukkot end up all the way in Chodesh Tishrei, six months later in the fall season? Well, way beyond the elucidation of what I'd like to share with you today, but just to kind of paraphrase on other teachings I have on the subject matter, is that basically, when you take a look at what we call the Peshat, the basic interpretation, the basic approach of Scripture, the observance of Sukkot and Torah actually used to go by another name. Most people know it as Sukkot. However, if you take a look at some passages early on in the Torah from the Chumash Shemot, you'll notice that Sukkot goes by a title called Chag Ha'asif. Chag, obviously, we refer to as a celebration, even though it actually refers to like a circuit. Okay, Ha'asif, the festival of ingathering. Okay, and this Chag Ha'asif is actually uh, related. Okay. Um, to what happened with the whole Golden Calf episode. And so after the Golden Calf episode, Chag Asif became known as Chag Sukkot, became known as the Festival of Sukkot, and also by the title Zman Simchotenu, or the phrase Zman, Zman Simchotenu, the time of our rejoicing. So the, the reason why it took a change in a name, essentially, is because it represents a return of the Shekhinah, because Israel basically... Uh, violated the will of Hashem on Har Sinai with the whole golden calf episode. This is what actually caused the Shekhinah to depart from Israel. And then through the parsha of Kitasa, Moshe engages in intercession. He's uh, debating with Hashem, negotiating with Hashem, begging Hashem in such a way, and arguing with Hashem to forgive Israel. Eventually God decides to forgive. And from there, we enter into parsha Vayachel and Pikudei, which the Torah tends to reiterate uh, pretty much what we read in Parsha Truma and Tetzaveh regarding the Kalim, the Mishkan, and things that are actually associated with those topics. And one of the reasons why the Torah repeats what it mentioned in those previous Parshiot is because when the command of building Hashem, a dwelling place, uh, the, what we call the Mishkan, the tabernacle, to create a dwelling place for Hashem, the initial command was not so much to focus on the physical edifice, okay, Rather was to focus on dwelling in the people, which is why the Torah says bitocham in Hebrew, not bitochai, but bitocham. Toch means in, bitocham is a plural pronoun, I would dwell in them. Okay? And so what we see there is that Hashem had a desire. Now, why does the Torah talk about things like the menorah and the Mizbeach and the Aron Habarit? Why does it talk about it if it never tended to make it physical? Well, I would invite you to go take a look at some of my previous teachings on the subject matter, and I share in great detail how those things were always designed to be a microcosm of man, which means that even without them physically existing, we can still derive a deep understanding of how they're applicable to you and I because they represent you and I, which is also why the halachot with inside the Jewish law that we follow, especially when it comes to the korbanot, the sacrificial system that also came as a result of the golden calf episode, we also take from that in such a way extrapolate from the korbanot system and we apply it to our prayers, okay, to the system of our prayers because the korbanot made up one third of the Torah. And so we also identify with that as well because you and I in, in such a way, we are a korban, we're a korban chai as we get up and we yield every day to the will of Hashem. So basically after this, Chag or uh, Chag Asif became known as Chag HaSukot because at this point, God restored His presence to Israel, okay? And Israel basically now began to rejoice. And so what we see about this episode is that when we go back to the Golden Calf episode, and even though the Torah doesn't always have a chronological order to it, and I explained this in many teachings before and way beyond to get into it now, but please I advise you to go back and take a look on some of the parts that I've taught upon this subject matter. And we basically take a look at Vayakha and Piku Day as somewhat sequential to each other, meaning one follows the other after God forgave Israel. Okay? And so what's interesting is that the eleventh of Tishrei, a day after Yom Kippur, uh, we read that the Mishkan is obviously the topic at hand, that God wants to focus on building it. And, and so what we look at in Parsha Piku Day is that that Torah portion tells us that on the 12th and the 13th of Tishrei, that the Jewish people responded by bringing their donations for the construction of the Mishkan. And then on the 14th of Tishrei, B'Tzalo began construction of the Mishkan, and then on the 15th of Tishrei, after completing the construction on the Mishkan, the Torah mentions that the Shekhinah returned 
to Israel. The glory of God appeared, as it says there in Shemot, Exodus chapter 40, verse 34. And it says, Vayachas ha'anan, that the cloud, it covered at Ohel, Moed, that the ten of meeting, and uchvod Adonai, mali et ha'mishkan, and the glory of Hashem filled the mishkan. Okay, so this is an allusion to obviously the cloud and what we call aneha kavod, the clouds of glory, is basically a reference to God's presence, the Shekhinah. So from the 15th of Tishrei, the Torah tells us that we celebrate Sukkot to commemorate the return of the Shekhinah. And this is why Sukkot, as we know it, even though the Torah mentions it's associated with Yitzhak Mitzrayim, and I have my teaching on that in another place, which I would encourage you to go take a look at to explain what that means, and also the various rabbinical debates about what type of sukkahs Israel dwelled in. Was a sukkah mamash, or was it actually uh, just a metaphor for the Shekhinah, the Ani HaKavod? Uh, but nonetheless, we see here is that as Sukkot became something that was established in the fall season, six months after Tishrei, we now refer to a Chacha Sukkot, okay, the festival of Sukkot. Okay, Zman Simchuteno, the time of our rejoicing. And so basically it represents a return, a reconciliation of the Shekhinah. Now, as I mentioned at the start of the teaching here, we officially end the high holiday season with our observance of Shmini Atzeret, right? Which is the eighth day unto itself, which is a farewell to the presence of Hashem, specifically back in the day when you had to travel to Yerushalayim, to the Har Habayit, the Temple Mount, and so you would return back to wherever you came from, whether or not you lived in Eretz Israel or Chutz Aretz, you were outside of Israel. Okay, and back in the day, they didn't have vehicles, trains, buses, or even airplanes. So obviously, they had to schlep along, and depending also if they traveled with their family, uh, that also was something they had to do in return. So in that journey away, they're not going to return back at least till six months later, which is Pesach. So this is a farewell ceremony. But as I also mentioned, we also have the special observance of Simcha Torah. It's uh, a day unto itself in the diaspora, but in Eretz Israel, once again, it's tied into the observance of Shemini Atzeret. Now, where does Simcha Torah come from? Okay, I mean, in other words, where does it originate from? Once again, I can, I can understand the return of the Shekhinah, five days after Yom Kippur, right? And how we basically have ended up with observing Sukkot in the month of Tishrei, even though it's somewhat connected to the month of Nisan. I can understand it, I can understand the symbolism and the metaphors and the allegories, I get that, okay? The problem here is, uh, what's going on with Simcha Torah? I mean, Shmini Atzeret is talked about in the Torah, we learn about in the, uh, the Ketavim and the Hebrew writings of, with Shlomo, okay? How the people were there, specifically, uh, as he was, uh, you know, basically finished building the Beha Mikdash. And so we see all that in the scripture. But what about Simcha Torah? Where is this at? You know, there's, a, there's a, a concept established that if you cannot find a, a basically uh, a, a, a minhag, a custom, a nusach, a tradition, if you can't find this in the Torah, it can be discarded. In other words, a person may come to their own understanding and they may observe something and it may mean something to them subjectively, but it does not mean it's objectively binding upon the entire nation. So where do we get Simcha Torah at? Where do we find this holiday, this, 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 uh, this small holiday? I don't want to say small, it's a major holiday as well in the sense of what it means, the energy that's connected with it, to understand the significance of it. Well, when we probe the observance of Simcha Torah, we discover something pretty strange. What do I mean? Well, once again, Simcha Torah is when we rewind the Torah scroll back to the beginning, back to Parashat Breshit. And Simcha Torah takes place on the 20th, second of Tishrei if you're in Israel or 23rd in the diaspora. Now, why is this strange? Whether you observe it in Israel or outside of Israel, I mean, we are basically 22 or 23 days into the new year, and now we're focusing on rewinding the Sefer Torah? It doesn't make sense. I mean, since the Hebrew calendar for the Jewish people begins at Chodesh Nisan, that's the first mitzvah God gave to Israel in Parashat uh, Bo, was Kiddush HaChodesh. That's the first mitzvah He gave them. In Mitzrayim. Maybe we should have Simchat Torah on the first of Nisan, or better yet, maybe we should actually have it on Shavuot because that does commemorate Kabbalat Torah, the receiving of God's Word. So why are we having Simchat Torah on the 22nd or 23rd day of Tishrei in the fall, and why do we do it with all this joy and dancing? I mean, 
We put on a big display. People take their Sifre Torah out, and depending on the community you belong to, many will basically march it around the bima in the synagogue. Some have a custom after they do that, they go outside around the synagogue. And there's also the custom of Chana uh, Sata Torah, dedicating a Torah scroll. Normally happens around, I mean, you can dedicate it anytime you want during the year, but some people like to reserve it for special holidays, such as Simcha Torah, maybe for Shavuot, things of that nature. And so whenever you have Chana Sata Torah, what you would do is you get everyone watch, marches around the neighborhood. It's like a whole block party. I mean, pretty strange. I mean, especially if you live in the Northern Hemisphere where everything's kind of getting cool at this time of the year and you got to wear a jacket. Uh, what's up with all the celebration and marching Sifre Torah outside? I mean, where does this come from? Well, I'll tell you where it comes from. The Torah tells us in Parsha Kitasa that when Moshe descended from Har Sinai with the first set of Luchot that he saw something, and this displeased him. What he saw was the Avodah Zara. He saw the sin of idolatry that people were committing. But there's something else that he saw within that scene that triggered him to break the tablets. And a lot of people overlook this. There in Shemot, Exodus chapter 32, verse 19, it says, um cholot. He saw the calf, and the Torah says, um cholot. He saw dancing. Dancing. Interesting. Why did the Torah describe that the Jewish people were dancing? Which is interesting because what type of dancing were they doing? Were they break dancing? I mean, were they doing the electric boogaloo? I mean, were they dancing with the stars? I mean, what type of dancing were they doing? I mean, I would like to know, you know, if they're going to basically get in trouble for what they were doing, at least tell us what type of dance moves they had. <laughs> I mean, what were they doing? Rabbi Alvario Saforno, he points out, that the reason why the Torah describes that the Jewish people were dancing is because it was the dancing that disgusted Moshe and caused him to shatter the Luchot. We turn there and Rav Safarno says in his commentary to, uh, to Parsha Kitasa, he says Moshe's anger was aroused over the fact that people rejoiced uh, over the damage to themselves that they had caused. And this is very interesting what he says, that the people rejoiced over the damage they did to themselves. So he's alluding to the actual Cheha Ego, that it was very damaging, which we, we read about, sadly, the, the repercussions of God's anger, what he wanted to do and cut the Jewish people off. But also, he focuses on to themselves specifically. That's interesting. And he says, we find something paralleled in Jeremiah chapter 11 and 15, where the prophet wrote over there, for you rejoice in performing, he says, your evil deeds. So what the Sephano sees over there in that passage is essentially is that in the days of Yermiyahu, the Jews were also invested in committing certain averot with a sense of pride, with a sense of confidence, with a sense of joy. And because of that, they were not able to be spiritually in tune to understand what was coming down the line. In other words, they were desensitized to the judgment that was fast approaching, which would lead with the destruction of the Beit HaMikdash and the exile of the Jewish people to the land of Bavel. And so, this forno goes on, he says afterwards, at this point, Moshe, dis he, he despaired of the people, doing the shuva before being punished. They were no longer fit to receive the Luchot. Now, it's a very serious subject, what happened here. Obviously, the whole scenario with Har Sinai is interesting within itself. I mean, you have a nation of people that were just taking on the Mitzrayim, a 50-day journey, which was accompanied with miraculous miracles and supernatural phenomena. And these individuals, this nation, collectively stood at a mountain that we call Har Sinai. And it was on this mountain which they experienced the revelation of the Creator of heaven and earth. Other religions around the world in all respect to them, they all have a similar theme. That theme is they have a prophet and their prophet had a revelation in some isolated area and this prophet was told by the Creator that they're the chosen one and therefore they have the proper religious belief of all humanity. And it repeats itself in different, you know, basically belief systems around the world. The Jewish people are the only people that are just recorded and described collectively as a nation of having one single revelation of the Creator of heaven and earth that took place thousands of years ago. And so what we see from that, when the people 
basically did not see Moshe returning, and they committed this, this transgression in a way because the Har Sinai experience was a, a, a marriage ceremony in a sense. A betrothal was taking place here with Am Israel, simultaneously with also the gathering them. So the whole Kedushan process, Har Sinai functioned as a chupa, as a wedding canopy. The Torah would act as a ketubah, as a marriage contract. However, the honeymoon was somewhat cut short because uh, a couple of individuals decided they're going to have a bachelor party down at the bottom of the mountain by creating the golden calf. And so we read about the damages that that caused. But when you look at that, and you know, you might think from a very a, a liberal perspective, right, some flexibility here, well, what's wrong with dancing, right? I mean, Moshe, maybe Moshe doesn't like dancing. Why does the Torah record him being triggered because people were dancing? And here's the answer to that. When a person sins, they usually feel a sense of remorse or conviction that will lead them to do shuva. However, God forbid if a person sins with joy, with happiness, well, if they do that, then they feel no shame. They feel no remorse. They feel no conviction because it's not something that they uh, basically identify with, especially, let's say, if they don't believe in the Creator. And so what happens when a person commits sin with no shame and doing it in joy, these individuals are beyond the stages of repair, of tikkun, or rectification. The joy of sinning makes them spiritually desensitized to do tshuva because they don't see anything wrong. They're only invested in their own self-gratification. This is why simcha or joy is a key ingredient in experiencing the shechina. Without joy, a person cannot receive gifts like nevuah, okay, or commune, with the presence of Hashem. Simcha is the vital power of the soul, and therefore if a person uses their joy in sitting, they are giving strength over to what we call the sitra achra, to the dark forces, which sadly causes them to go beyond a point of no return. So what we see here is that when Moshe saw the Jewish people, creation of Vodazara, the idolatry of the golden calf, they were also involved in joyful dancing. They were desensitized that what they did, there was no wrong to it. And so this means that the only way Israel could prove to Hashem that they had been fully delivered from the forces of darkness is by reversing the joy that they used for the Chet Egel, okay, the uh, Egel Zahav, I should say, for the golden calf, is that they need to use it for the worship of Hashem. Just as they use their Yetzahara to sin with joy, they now must use their Yetzahara to rectify their sin and worship Hashem with greater joy than that of the golden calf. And because Israel were able to harness the spiritual strength to rectify the sin of the golden calf, they were worthy to inherit the Torah. And so the Midrash comes along and it comments on this unique rectification by pointing out that the mission of Tikkun does not depend entirely upon Hashem, but it depends upon us, upon Israel. And this is very important because a lot of people think that they sit in their blessed tuchas and they twiddle their thumbs that somehow the gula is going to come by itself. That Hashem snaps his finger, waves a magic wand, and poof, Mashiach pops out the sky. No, it doesn't work that way. The tikkun process rests on the shoulders of Israel. God does his part, we do our part. It's all about the reciprocal nature of that covenant that we have. And so the Midrash comes along and they shed some very interesting light upon this concept. We see over here, um, basically in Parsha Piku Dei, which the Midrash is picking up on. In Parsha Piku Dei, God's relationship with Israel is described as a progression. It goes on from, let's say, a daughter to a mother. And so the Midrash says that, you know, God loved Israel as BT, my daughter. Then he loved Israel as Achoti, my sister. And then lastly, God loved Israel as Imi, my mother. As it says here, Chacha Chodosh Buuchu. However, the Holy One, blessed be He, originally, okay, said to the people of Israel, excuse the typo there, that He said to them that you, the Israel Bat, you are my daughter, as it says in Tehillim, Psalm 45, verse 11. And it says, therefore, Shimi Vat, hear, O daughter, and see and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. It says, He persisted in His endearment of them until He called them my sister, as it stated. Asher HaSharim, Song of Songs, chapter 5, 2. And it says over there, Open, Pichili Achoti, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is filled with dew, my locks with rain, 
of the nights. And then the Midrash goes on to say afterwards, and he further, perf further persisted, excuse me, in his endearment of them until he called them my mother, as is stated in Yeshayahu Isaiah chapter 51, verse 4, Shinamar, it says over there, Pay attention to me, my people. Give ear to me, for instruction will come forth from me, and my judgment will be a light for peoples to whom I will give rest. Now you might say in the passage there, where, where does it say my mother at? It doesn't say, you know, in me. It doesn't say that passage there. What does that mean? How does that correspond to a mother? We will answer that. On top of that question, one of the things that came to my mind many years ago is why is the Midrash betraying God's increasing love for Israel from a daughter, sister to a mother? What's up with that? Well, the Midrash is describing Israel's spiritual maturity through the lenses of Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Each stage in its progression corresponds to another period in the earlier years of Israel's history, specifically Yitziat Mitzrayim. At the time of the Exodus, Israel was basically almost without any zechut or merit. The Ramban, Nachmanides, and amongst other sages say in their comments on the Torah that basically the last bit of merit of Abraham was almost snuffed out from the Jewish people because they were so far in Tuma impurity, what they call the 49th gate of Tuma, which basically would eradicate the covenant that God had established with the Avot. And therefore, they were only saved by the grace of Hashem, which is sadly why only one-fifth of the Jewish people made it out when four, uh, where the other four-fifths perished, whether that was through physical death or assimilation. And so the Midrash goes on to record that at the time of the Exodus, leading up to Kiryat Yam Suf, the splitting of the Red Sea, and which Hashem drowned the Mitzrayim, that some of the angels got into an argument with Hashem, demanding that the Jewish people be put to death alongside of the Mitzrayim of the Egyptians, because they were also guilty for the same sins that the Egyptians committed. We read this over here in Shech HaSharim Rabbah, it says it's over there, it is written, and it quotes here from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 32, in which a question was asked specifically by Moshe to Israel regarding their history, in which he says, O Hanisa Elohim, lavo lechachat lo goy mekerev goy. Had any God ever miraculously come to take for himself a nation amid a nation? And so it says, Rabbi Yehoshua said in the name of Rabbi Hanan, a nation it does not say over here, excuse me, there's a typo. It does not say a nation from amid a people. So in other words, in the Hebrew, it would say amim, okay, or a goy from amidst of amim, or a people, an am per se, from amid a goy. That's not what's written here. Rather, what's written here is that it's a goy, okay, that's mekerev goy, a nation that was drawn near from a nation. And so they go on to say this teaches that the Mitzrayim were uncircumcised and the Jews were uncircumcised. Also, the Mitzrayim, they grew locks from their hair. Likewise, the Jews grew locks from their hair. And also says the Mitzrayim were for, wore forbidden mixtures. And likewise, the Jews also wore, uh, wore forbidden mixtures. Now, I'm going to explain here what this means before we finish the remaining part of the quote. When the Midrash mentions over here, that the quotation of Deuteronomy 4.32, when Moshe asked Israel, had there had any other God, have you ever heard of any God, per se, amongst the, the, the deities that the Gentiles worship, take for themselves a nation, okay? Take for themselves a nation. L'chachach lo goy, mekerav goy. A nation from a midst of the nation. So the Torah does not differentiate between the term goy in that passage. It's used for both the Mitzrayim and the Jewish people. And so it can be understood that the term goy is being used to basically identify both people as identical. Even though the Jews have Hebrew names and the Mitzrayim, they would actually have uh, Egyptian names per se, right? And that may have some separation, but pretty much they were identical in culture, lifestyle. I mean, there's various Midrashim that tells us that instead of influencing the Mitzrayim, that the Jews were influenced by Mitzrayim. And so they were basically assimilating, and they were losing that identity. They were on the verge of basically snuffing out the merit that Abraham Yitzhak and Yaakov had invested so much into. And the other thing what most people don't realize is the word goy 
usually has a negative connotation. They hear it as something derogatory. They think, oh, you know, Jews use it to basically be condescending to non-Jews. And it could be used in a condescending way, but the word goy within itself, Israel is described as a goy in many places. Exodus 19.6, God tells Israel that you are mamlechet chonim, v'goy kadosh. You are a nation of kingly priests, a holy nation. The word goy comes from the Hebrew word giviyah. Giviyah deals with physiognomy, which deals with the certain details of an individual's makeup, which means that Physiognomy deals with what separates one group of people from another group of people. Israel was somewhat identical to the Gentiles in Egypt. They were somewhat unique at the same time. They stood out. And so what we see here in the Midrash is that Israel is being considered charged as guilty from the angels. Basically, they were guilty of committing a vote of Zara. Okay? And so this is why the Midrash goes on to the next point when it talks about that the Mitzrayim were uncircumcised and the Jews were also uncircumcised. Well, after the generation Yaakov passed away and all his sons died, Yosef and his brothers, the next generation had abandoned the mitzvah of Brit Milah, of circumcision. And so they never followed it because they were assimilated. They didn't think it was relevant, which is why also when they performed the Pesach, right before they left from Mitzrayim, as we get the parasha of Bo, is in that passage there, they also had two bloods. They had the blood of the actual uh, Corban of the Pesach, which was essentially the mockery of a de an Egyptian deity, but also the blood of the Brit, the circumcision that was also applied to the doorposts. These two bloods, which correspond Midah HaChesed and Midat Hadin. Next, the Midrash mentions that, you know, that the Mitzrayim grew locks from their hair and the Jews grew locks from their hair. Now, what that means is that it's not a reference to having a full, uh, you know, head of dreadlocks, right? Like a lot of people you see around the world, like uh, Jamaicans or what's called Rastafarians. It's not referring to that type of dreadlocks. Rather, the Midrash is alluding to a custom that the pagans back in those days, they used to actually grow like a dreadlock. It was, you can say it was a dreadlock from the back of their head, right near the Abdullah Magala area. And what they did from the Adula Magala is that they would just grow a, a wad of hair and they would basically dread it and they would grow it as long as possible. However, they would keep the rest of the head shaved, the top, the sides, and they would use a, a razor blade. Now, halakha, it's prohibited to use a razor blade to shave. You can use an electric razor and the thing is to avoid nicking the skin or causing any type of uh, you know, mutation to the skin by scarring the skin. The area where the peyotes grow at or same thing with the beards, the, you know, the different corners and things. Um, even though the pagans would grow this out, it's what they would do with the rest of their head and also their face. They would keep everything shaved. They were clean shaven, no, no facial hair. And so basically the Jewish people also emulated that. They also started to grow their hair out like that. And so it was assimilation. And not only that, it's not just assimilation because it was a secular culture thing. Okay, rather it was a custom they did because of a vote of Zara. This is something they did based upon their religious beliefs. And so when Israel did this, they were basically assimilating into a form of idolatry is what they were doing. Next up, the Midrash mentioned is that the Mitzrayim wore forbidden mixtures, and the Jews also wore forbidden mixtures. Now, forbidden mixtures in Hebrew is called shatnitz, okay, which refers to a prohibition of wearing certain mixed clothing. The Midrash doesn't talk about shatnitz, even because if you look at the Hebrew, it says elu lovishe, okay, kilaim. There's, uh, there's different clothing that they wore, okay, is literally what it means. But when we look at it, we can understand it. Obviously, it's referred to this different clothing, this mixed clothing. Someone has a connotation of shotnitz, okay? Even though shotnitz was prohibited after the giving of the Torah, the Midrash is kind of alluding to it uh, somewhat in a metaphorical manner to describe how the Jewish people dress like the Mitzrayim. And that basically, the Mitzrayim's clothing was based upon a Vodah Zara. And so what's happening here is that there's a mixture of two things, a forbidden mixture, which the Torah prohibits. By being the children of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and they were supposed to worship Hashem, the Jewish people now begin mixing in and associating with the idolatry, okay, of the Egyptians. So the Midrash sees this as a metaphorical form of shatnitz. It's a prohibition of what they're doing. So nonetheless, it's idolatry. So while Israel, basically what we see here, was not 
worthy of redemption, Hashem still showed them kindness by punishing the Mitzrayim and performing miracles uh, that brought about the Exodus event. And then we have the remaining quote of the Midrash, which I'd like to get to here. It goes on to say, After this, in ken lo midat hadin, the attribute of judgment, midat hadin, did not allow for the people of Israel to ever be redeemed. And therefore, Rav Shmuel Bar Nachman said, had the Holy One, blessed be He, not bound Himself with an oath to redeem them, the people of Israel would never have been redeemed. Chasas Khalil, God forbid. But Israel has been redeemed. And so what we see here is that this is this chesed, chen chesed, this great kindness that God has bestowed upon Israel. And so in this period, the relationship between Hashem and Israel is considered unequal like a father and a daughter in which the father gives and the daughter receives. And so in this type of relationship, there is no reciprocation taking place because obviously one is always giving, 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 and the other is always receiving. And so at the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim, Israel is receiving the great chesed from Hashem. They're not like their fathers, Avraham Yitzhak Yaakov, that didn't depend upon chesed per se. They dealt Hashem from the attribute midat hadin, while they experienced Hashem via midat hachesed. Okay? And both obviously have their pros and cons depending on how spiritually mature one is. From Yitziat Mitzrayim, we see that the relationship between Hashem and Israel then evolves at Kabbalah the Torah. As Shavuot old, Israel was no longer the recipient of unearned chesed. Rather, Israel's deeds established them as equal partners with Hashem by entering into covenant with Him at Har Sinai. And so in order to be worthy to receive the Torah, Israel had to prepare themselves three days in advance. And the Torah tells us a parasha Yithro that Hashem informed Moshe to inform the people Married couples need to separate. They need to hit a mikveh, okay? And therefore, they must be in a state of purity. That way, they're going to enter into this renewed covenant with Hashem. They're become, becoming, in a way, born again, if I can use that term. And so the relationship between Israel and Hashem Har Sinai was akin to that of sisters. And what do I mean by that? Well, in, we see here two parties are on equal footing. Each one is contributing neither was made the supplicant, okay? So both are somewhat parallel here. However, what we see after the Shavuot experience is that Moshe was on the mountain. You know, he's supposed to be scheduled for 40 days, and he's receiving the first set of Luchot, of the Torah. However, the Jewish people at that time, they breached their part of the covenant by committing the sin of the golden calf. And so as a tikkun of that sin, the Torah describes how after Hashem forgave the Jewish people that the people physically contributed to the building of the Mishkan, which then resulted in the return of the Shekhinah. This is why Parashat Vayakha on Pekul Day repeats the two parashiyot of Truma and Tetzaveh. And so at this part of Hashem's relationship with Israel, the initiative was completely upon the Jewish people. And so the relationship was similar to that of a mother. What does a mother do? What's her nature? A mother is constantly giving, giving herself. She does all that is needed for the welfare of her children, her husband, her family. And so when you take a look at, let's say, a mother and child, while a child contributes nothing, the mother is contributing everything. And so at Sukkot, Israel is considered, figuratively speaking, God's mother, right? Chasas Chalila, it's not like they're the Virgin Mary or anything. Why are they considered God's mother, figuratively speaking? Because instead of depending upon Hashem to do everything for them, like what happened at Pesach, they did what was needed to rectify their relationship with Hashem. And so the energy and joy that they used to sin with the golden calf was now converted during that Sukkot experience in worshiping Hashem. And so the outcome of Sukkot and Shmini Atzeret is Simcha Torah. It is the rejoicing of the Torah. Which is why in Chasidut, Chasidic thought, there is great focus on the energy that is actually hanging within the atmosphere of the creation at this time of between Israel and Hashem when it comes to rejoicing and dancing. And so what we learn here is that as we observe Simchat Torah, there is a time that we need to kind of engender within us that joy. If you could think about a chet that you committed, okay? and you had joy doing it, 
Well, try to actually outdo that by doing having joy before Hashem or rejoicing before Him. That's why we take Sifrei Torah out whenever there's Chan Sata Torah and we have a block party. Everyone's walking around the block. You know, after they walk around, they're Hakafol to the Bima in the synagogue. They go outside, they're singing, they're dancing, they're rejoicing. Why? Because that joy is the anticipation of what we just went through for the seven days. And as I explained in my previous teachings, really Sukkot is about rebirth. We're entering a new stage that we are now being reborn in a way, right? The same physical body, true, but there's something changing in the higher spiritual realms and also the lower realms, which eventually concretize throughout the up and coming year. And so we enter our sukkah, we wave our arba menim. Uh, this is why we are in the, the shekhinah per se. We embrace uh, the presence of God. There's joy. And the consummation of that comes out through Shemini Yatzeret and Simchat Torah. And so, Chavarim, what I would like to encourage each and every one of you to do is to have joy, abundant joy, abundant simcha, v'sason, happiness, joy, rejoicing. I'm reminded of the passage in Psalm 100, Mizmor le David is a psalm of David, okay, that we should rejoice before Hashem. We should constantly rejoice. Mizmor le David, that we should rejoice in that passage, it says, Eve do at Adonai besimcha. Eve do, serve Hashem in joy. Besimcha, some translations say with joy, besimcha, in joy. Eve do at Adonai besimcha. We must serve Hashem in joy. And so I'll encourage you all, if you're depressed, get off of your depression. Kick it out the window. Go and, you know, start rejoicing before Hashem. Yeah, I don't care if you don't have a Sefer Torah, if you have a Chumash, you have something, you have the Bible, pick it up, rejoice. Rejoice for God's Word. It is the blueprint for our souls. And so with that said, Chavarim, I hope that this teaching is a blessing to you, a challenge to you, and also help expand your awareness about the significance of our observance of Simcha Torah. And so with that said, Chavarim, I want to thank you for joining with me. Until next time, may the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov bless you and your families. Shalom, Kotu, and Chag Zimei.